happy to theater artists from New York, from the US and around the world to hear what's on their mind, what they are thinking, um, how they experience this unprecedented moment where we are all inside a catastrophe mo movie. Uh, it's a creational myth with a mad king and the plague in the country, people out of jobs, people not having enough to eat. And uh, what's gonna happen and what decisions are we gonna make? We as people for ourselves, as theater makers and also as members of the society and artists always we feel have answers. They have always been on the right side of social justice on the right side of the complex struggle for liberties and for freedom. And um, we have to listen to them always, but perhaps never was a more important time to listen to artists and not just to the politicians, to the uh, virologists, uh, economists, what theater people, theater artists have to say is of essence, it's of importance of what life is all about. And we should listen very, very careful. Um, as we all know, the, the signs around us are not good. Uh, there is a resurgence of the virus, Florida, Texas, California, all the numbers are up again. The summer did not bring any relief and no uh, therapy or no vaccination is in sight. So uh, we uh, are in a place of uncertainty and our lives are in danger. The wrong handshake could kill us or even getting the COVID as we know, we might get serious lung damage, heart damage. We don't know what long-term effects are. So there has never been in my lifetime and in many lifetimes such a such a such a complicated serious and dangerous situation all theaters are closed still in the us um, the big ones but there are um, initiatives uh, outside the big cities and we will we'll hear a bit about it uh, today and uh, of course theater artists have been hit hard as all artists musicians uh, out of jobs out of gigs and uh, it's a disastrous time so we need to support artists we have to be there for them but we also need to listen to them, what they have to say, because they are not just victims, they are also of this, they are uh, uh, intelligent uh, human beings who perhaps perceive the present much stronger than we do. They anticipate the future. So much of their work has been dealing with environmental problems, problems in our society and politics, and we should have listened to them. This is not just a story for a play, entertainment, it really has a meaning behind it. And now it becomes clear that we have to understand um, that better. Yesterday we had Jacques Rancière, the great French philosopher, and uh, I'm not sure if I completely did him justice, but his idea of radical equality, of equality of intelligence, of listening to each other, to find ways to share uh, uh, the space at the table, disenfranchised members who are demanding to be part of society, how significant it is, and actually that they also don't need our help or salvation. All we have to do is listen, and also they will come up with their own answers as uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, so many of us are doing now. Um, with us today, we have uh, a member um, of the New York uh, theater community who um, we think of as, uh, uh, how would one say, like a Statue of Liberty is like a landmark. And it's uh, the great uh, Morgan Jeunesse who uh, has been um, since her early work in life uh, with the theater, with the New York theater, starting with the uh, uh, public and going back to Joe Papp. She is an educator, an activist. Uh, she worked in a literary office as an associate producer at the public and uh, New York Theater Workshop and LATC. So was she an associate artistic director and she is overall a dramaturg as someone who defines her work bigger or in a different context than just the show itself, the uh, production itself, say, what are the connections? What are the social impact? What are the historical impacts? Why do we do this show? For whom? What is it um, good for? She has been a creative uh, consultant at many agencies, Abrams and Helen Merrill. She has helped so, so many young artists when they started out, uh, the Taylor Max or George Foxes of the world, and many, many others when they are not where they were now. Uh, it was Morgan who was there for them. And everybody in the theater respects her, loves her. And uh, her concerns are also uh, our uh, concerns. And uh, she got an OB for long-term support of playwrights. Uh, she has the LMDA Lessing Award after Gottfried Ibrahim Lessing, the significant, maybe first dramaturg on planet Earth. 
and um, and now she also works with Double Edge Leader as a creative uh, consultant and is involved in La Mama, and in a project she calls in this distant globe. A creation distracted. Distracted, it is distracted globe, globe. and um, so, so it is. something you will talk to us about. So um, as I always say, I say it's all about listening, and then I talk and talk and talk. Forgive me. Morgan, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's uh, great to have you with us. It's perhaps uh, the last week of uh, these kind of talks after four months. We take a little break and rethink. So it's an important uh, moment. Um, so um, wh where are you? I am in the up at Double Edge in the artistic director's home, Stacy Klein's home. I have been here working on this project, uh, which is called, I'm going to talk about it more later, Six Feet Apart All Together, which is live theater. And okay. uh, what's interesting about being here is that Double Edge has been very much about social justice, community, art. And, and the intersections between all of that mm. in terms of the work they do here on the farm. They do a summer spectacle every year. The work that they've done in other theaters touring around, they had a tour just interrupted by COVID of Leonor and Alejandro about Leonor Carrington, the great surrealist artist who lived in Mexico after she fled Europe uh, during the Second World War. Uh, so that was interrupted and it was kind of the idea of, yes, what do we do when things shut down? And I think what I love about uh, them and some of the other people that I've worked with and we'll talk about is that they tend to put the word how in front of a phrase, right? So can we do it? It's not so much can we do it, but how can we do it? And also, what is it that we are doing? Very much what you talked about. Like, I'm glad you talked about it because you really set up a lot of the things that I deeply believe in, in terms of dramaturgy. And I always like to say that I, I don't like nouns so much. I know Gertrude Stein talked about about embracing the noun. I like to embrace the verb or the active sentence. So I like to say I've committed many acts of dramaturgy and haven't been arrested yet that might happen in the future. So, and that whole thing that the dramaturgical approach to everything is a dramaturgical approach. How do things work? Why do they work? Who do they work for, right? All those questions that you ask of a play, you really ask in life and in the world, in politics and social structures. Like right now that we're in the biggest piece of theater, you know, um, I always quibbled with Susan Sontag a little bit when she was talking, you know, against illness being a metaphor, that it wasn't a metaphor. And I do think that, and I understand why she said that, because it was a time where people were being blamed kind of for their own cancer, you know, for their, that somehow it was some sort of psychological detriment on their part that made them ill. And I agree with her that that's very dangerous territory. But when you talk about a plague, which actually is not necessarily the original term, doesn't necessarily mean an illness. It means an attack. It means an attack of some kind. So if you talk about a plague and what's being revealed in that plague and the revelation of that, which is an apocalypse, uh, an apocalypse is a revelation. A apocalypse is an uncovering. Uh, a, a scholars say that it comes from Ulysses when he tore off Calypso's road. He, he apocalypsed himself and freed himself and was able to swim uh, up to the surface. But the whole idea of the revelation that any apocalypse brings is really interesting to me because I think what's happening now is that we are being revealed to ourselves in very deep ways. And I have to say first that we're very lucky. We're sitting here, we're on Zoom, we're talking about, you know, esoteric, you know, aesthetics and, you know, ethics to a certain point. But there's so many people who are in dire straits and who will be in dire straits. What's going to happen in fall with people who are jobless, people who might be evicted, people who are ill or families are ill, whole communities that are so vulnerable. But also those communities, many of them, have already been incredibly vulnerable. So I think in a way that this time reminds me of two lines, one of them which I think is really reflective of our time, which is from George C. Wolfe's A Colored Museum, which I had the great pleasure and honor to work with, where it starts out with Miss Pat 
who's a stewardess flying a plane, celebrity slave ship, the plane over history. And she's pointing to various aspects of history. And at one point she flies over the Great Depression and she says, oh, there's the Great Depression. Now everyone gets to live the way we've been living. So the whole thing of what we are being affected by in our kind of middle-class Western world going, oi, 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 right? Many, many people have been living with for a long time. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is like you said, but a lot of people say, you know, you seem really like optimistic or happy. And it's like, no, I'm never optimistic. I'm an incredible pessimist. But one thing is I may be optimistically defiant. Uh, what uh, a Tony calls a pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will, which he says he stole from some German philosopher, but I bet he said it much more succinctly. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing, but the other line that always stays with me is Larry Kramer, who I also had the great pleasure to work with several times in his play, The Normal Heart where basically Ned Week says, and this was very much the way Larry felt, and I think in some ways it's what bonded Larry and I to each other because I felt very similarly because of various things in my past and just the way I grew up in the world, where he says, everybody's walking around as if we're at peace and I'm the only one who seems to know we're at war, right? So the whole idea is that this is history. This is human history. These little windows that we have where we're all in a bubble and comfortable and feel safe and whatever, I always feel they're false. And when they happen, I don't trust them. And when something like this happens, I somewhat go, oh yes, there is the world. There, there it is, that's people. And now what are we gonna do about it? And how can we do things within it and about it? And how can we tango with it and maybe not always get dipped and dropped. And how do we work with the tides of history? Like I once said to Larry when he was going to address a, a crowd, it was a very, very moving moment, um, that uh, he felt, how am I gonna give this crowd any kind of hope? It was bad. And I said, well, you know, you always, we always think that we have to have progress. We have to move forward. We have to move forward. But sometimes the greatest triumph you can have is not being completely swept away. And that's about holding ground. And holding ground, you can hold ground so much better if you hold ground in a community. And that's why the whole thing with theater, why I love being here at this point, because it really is regrounding and understanding that theater has always been in one way or another, even broad, the most commercial Broadway show has been about being at the center of a community being the, the nucleus that people want to come around and orbit around or be comets and just, you know, kind of pay a little visit for a second or, you know, bye. So the whole idea of theater being the loci, locus point of a community, being the center, it's, you know, the universal laws of the universe and of, of, of physics, the nucleus, the center of gravity, the, the soul of the sun, the, the solars system. Um, so I think, and I, I think I'm still very romantic about the theater. I do go back to not only Greek, but a lot of indigenous cultures, which saw the theater still very much connected to a performance of community, a performance of um, just pulling in that Greek work, word again, though it, it comes up in so many cultures, the idea of entheos asmos, that you bring the deity down. It's not prayers going up, right? My prayers go up, right? It's, it's the idea of bringing the deity, the spirits down so that you're possessed by them. And you see rituals that actually do this uh, in Haiti and other you know, places in Africa where you are possessed, not only the shaman, sense, shamanistic center, but the community that is participating in the, in the ritual are possessed by the deity by the spirit. And one of my favorite uh, sort of translations is that entheos asmos is really the root of enthusiasm. 
So you don't say I'm enthusiastic about something, but you're enthusiastic in a much deeper way. It's just like, oh, this makes me excited. It's like, oh, I am, you know, I, I'm strengthened, I'm fulfilled. I, I'm, I can stand in the place where I am and feel pride and power within that. And then I can open up uh, to the community and the community will share in that. So that it, all the ancient roots of theater for me still apply, no matter what the form is. Even Zoom, I've, I've seen Zoom experiences where I kind of go, whoa, this actually is not just people saying, oh, well, we can't do something, so we're just gonna do a reading with our heads, which is fine because that also makes communities. A lot of theaters that can't be live will do Zoom performances or Zoom, this what you've been doing, is a community that's that is like more than anything i think is no matter who talks or what they talk about it is creating and enlarging this nucleus of ideas and thoughts that has a gravitational pull and that can also uh you know have an impact on the people who listen on what people think about the more we think about the more we feel and the more we see again going back to original words theater teatron meant the seeing place. And as Zelda Fitch Handler said and reminded all of us when the new arena stage opened up some years ago, the seeing place does not only mean what you are looking at, but how it is reflecting into seeing back into yourself as an individual and as a community, as a society. Whether you're talking about the Athens, should we really have a court system, which is what the Oristia really is about, you know, or, you know, whatever it is that we're seeing back into ourselves. So uh, I think the form, like a lot of people are going, oh my God, Zoom and all this. I said, no, that's a form. And some people have done amazing things with Zoom. I mean, I think Richard Nelson, when he's done these new plays with the Apple family, mm -hmm. yeah. those are two of my favorite plays because they absolutely live in the situation that they're in which all those plays did, you know, they were bailed to, they were, you know, written too open on elections. Nobody knew what was gonna happen. Richard was writing them up to the very first performance. But these, these last ones, you know, which incorporates COVID, which incorporates Zoom, which is absolutely present in the context in which it in, in some ways, I think they're my favorites because of, they're so immediate. And also there's something very powerful of people looking directly at you, right? Breaking the fourth wall. We have like space and time and glass and everything in between us, but we're looking at each other. And like, uh, I felt I taught a lot of classes from spring and summer, you know, on Zoom, on Zoom. But, you know, I would have a student in China who would get up at six in the morning to come to the seven o'clock evening class, you know, and people were, were, were coming from all over the country and all over the world and joining. And you see these readings, which I love, where they put the actors' names and then they say where they're, you know, where they're located. And all of a sudden, time and space is just collapsed. Um, so there's something interesting in that in terms of what we learn from this time about ourselves, about a society, about that word that's been thrown around so much, what is essential, the essential workers, which are often the most vulnerable workers and the least cared for workers in the society otherwise, right? So what is essential, I think is so fascinating to look at right now. But I think going back to that central idea that it is about reflecting to a community and giving a community a locus point on, around which they can gather. And if they can gather around it in some way physically still, that becomes really, really exciting. So that's, uh, yeah. So that's why I'm happy to be here. Well, really, thank you. Thank you, thank you for, for, for being with us and for sharing this. Is a that is uh, also um, of significance of what you say. Where were you when, when, it, when it started? When did you become aware of the corona? I was in New York City. And actually, interestingly enough, I, I went to one of the last live performances in New York City before everything got shut down, which was the audience sitting in a ball pit at Taylor Max Lafray 
not only were we like, you know, somewhat near, even though we were just, you know, they tried to dis or we were already trying to distance the audience. It was the last, I think it was actually the last show that performed. And the balls, the plastic balls were disinfected. So they were probably even cleaner than the seats were. But that's where I was. Uh, I was in New York City. Yeah. I was in New York City and teaching and I'd go to the foundry office, Melanie's office, uh, to teach because she had better Wi-Fi than I did at home. Uh, and I also just liked walking, like just getting out, like felt very daring and very revolutionary to get out and be masked and avoid everybody, but walk five blocks to the foundry office, you know? So I thought, well, that's essential. I have to go to the store and I have to, you know, do those things and I have to go teach. That is essential. Hmm. And then you, you stayed in your apartment for a month, a couple of weeks? Yeah, or? yeah. So I mainly, uh, yeah, for, for months. Well, I didn't because I started joining the demonstrations that, that happened. Um, so you went out and demonstrated? After yeah, that. not. I didn't go to as many as I wanted to because I was a little worried. Um, I had a cough, which ended up being like bronchial and, and not. I got tested. So, you know, I didn't really go out and much uh, uh, until, you know, I, I was fairly sure that I was okay. Um, I'd also been exposed to see friends who uh, had lost a, a family member. And I, I sort of said, I don't care. You're in grief and I'm going to hug you and hold you with my mask on and facing away. But, you know, if the deities want to kill me because I'm feeling compassion for people in great loss, well, then go ahead and do that. And then if you exist when I die, I'm going to come up and smack you around. So, <laughs> but that's, you know, goes back to defiance. Um, mm. You know, when people say, do you have optimism? Do you have hope? And I said, no, not really. But I have a lot of defiance. Mm. So you put your life at risk to go to the demonstrations. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Though the demonstrators, I have to say, most of the demonstrators were masked. Who was not masked was the police. Mm. And there's this great streamer that I love called O oh Robin, who like has some amazing videos. I would watch when I couldn't go out, I would watch his, his live streams and he just has somehow got incredible footage of a lot of the demonstrations. And what he was starting to do, which was really funny, he'd go up to the police and go, put your mask on, why aren't you wearing your mask? Put your mask on, put your mask on. You know, and it's yeah. like, yeah, you know, it's like they're saying, you know, in New York state, this is the law and here's the supposedly, you know, the people enforcing the law, breaking the law, and in other ways. Yeah. So, um, yeah. It did, did not help. Um, But that was theater. That was a theatrical event. That was a theatrical event. And it yeah. was a theatrical event in the Boal way of spect actors, right? Because everyone yeah. who was there was participating as a spect actor. They were participating in the play of, of defiance mm. and in the play of calling out and in the play of putting a spotlight on another virus, another kind of plague within the society. And I mm. think that's the whole thing. It's like, what are all these other plagues? It's so interesting. You know, now everyone's talking about Shakespeare and also the Greeks and Camus suddenly is really popular. And you think about Arto, you know, and theater as the plague and how much that, you know, uh, seems to, to you know, to, uh, to resonate, you know, and, and like Naomi Wallace's One Flea Spared is, you know, being revived. And it's interesting in terms of, You know, looking at this, uh, and but looking at it, not literally, but again, sorry, Susan Sontag, as a metaphor. Yeah, as a metaphor. Something real. Yeah, I think Aroncia yesterday talked about the 68 demonstrations in France, where um, mm. leading mm. Marx theories would say they have no leader. Yeah, this is, can't be supported. This is, and he said, uh, presence changed. Yes. And the theory comes later. Yes. And he yes. said, 
people went out there and they had showed presence and they uh, said like artists people on the street are imagining a better life they want to have a new perspective they yep. say what they see does not work and they demand to be you know at the table they demand a fair share they demand uh, living conditions that uh, access to education health and the arts of course as we think uh, that and that, that it is actually the present that does those things that really change and it means something might already have changed because they they, they come in in your more lifetime of working for the theater um, in this very moment what what do you think what do you think of, of theater when, when well, it's interesting because I had already started to have a lot of thoughts about theater and what I saw was a kind of habit of theater and uh, show business theater and the marketplace of theater and the why do we do theater. I felt people didn't know why they were doing theater. They were doing theater out of habit. They were doing theater out of ego. They were doing theater for a lot of reasons that I was kind of thinking, oh, I don't know, theater is not so interesting to me anymore. I was so immersed and excited about the theater when I first came to New York in the mid seventies. And then I was lucky enough to fall into, like I always say, I'm a little kitchen dog in my, in my career. And a kitchen dog is you open up the back door to take out the trash and you leave the door ajar and you come in and there's a little stray dog in your kitchen and it kind of looks like Benji and it needs a bath and it's hungry and it wags its tail and licks your hand and you say, oh, cute little dog, come on in the house. And 10 years later, you can't get it out of your best chair, right? And it's just part mm -hmm. of the family. So I've been very lucky in terms of the doors that happen to be open that I snuck into. So the public theater, huh? But when was that moment? When did you snuck in? What happened? That moment. With the public theater? Or in general, when you came to the theater, you said, how you got into the door? What was that moment? Uh, well, I, a couple of things. When I was about eight years old, I went to see Shakespeare, at, uh, live Shakespeare at the Sylvan Theater outdoors in Washington, DC. The Sylvan Theater was at the base of the Washington Monument. And the woman who started it, oh, I'm so sorry, I don't remember her name, had actually been inspired by Joe Papp and had been advised by Joe Papp into how to make a summer outdoor theater for Shakespeare. So it was wonderful. And we saw Midsummer Night's Dream, which I thought was fabulous. And they had Puck climb the fir tree at the end with the spotlight on it. And it was just magical and Shakespeare and the language. And just, I was entranced with theater. Um, and there was a funny story that the next year they did a winter's tale, which made me really mad. I hissed to my parents, why are there so many shepherds? And I didn't like the clown and I just wanted to get back to the story. And then I got really mad about the ending. And I said, what, Hermione? She wasn't a statue. She was like, where was she for 16 years, knitting? Uh, and I tried to talk about that to my parents. And I remember leaning back in the back seat of the car thinking, they can't have this discussion with me. I'm like baby dramaturg, right? They can't have this discussion with me. They can't be my parents. It turned out they weren't really my parents, which was really mm -hmm. odd. But then years later, Bill Kane, the great Bill Kane, the writer and, and Jesuit priest who had started the Boston Shakespeare Festival, I told him this story and he just laughed. And he said, no, no, no. He said, when Hermione got all this horrible news, her husband and the loss of her children and just everything in her world turning upside down, she literally had went into a catatonic state. And Polina for 16 years every morning takes her out of bed and feeds her and puts her in the chair where she looks out at the countryside, you know, and tries to talk to her, but she's basically been catatonic. And then when she hears her husband and she hears her daughter, she comes out of that state. And I said, where were you when I was nine? <laughs> so uh, um, Shakespeare was one of my first loves. That's the whole thing, when, you know, coming, being, falling into the public theater and Joe Papp and the love of Shakespeare. In fact, in this distracted globe is from a Hamlet uh, quote where he says, alas, poor, you know, memory, you know, alas, poor ghost, remember, you know, yes, while memory holds the seat in this distracted globe, in which it's a pun about the theater, 
but it's also his mind and it's also the world, right? So it's just that whole thing about this distracted globe. Um, so that's kind of the name of my consultancy, which I, I came up with over 10 years ago, uh, but seems more appropriate than ever in terms of how do you find the center of gravity in the distracted globe, right? How do you re-gravitate uh, to the core that keeps the, spe the planet from spinning out? And that's very much in terms of the, the way I approach dramaturgy is what is at the core. Like in terms of the Aristotelian elements, I always felt for me that thought why, the why of something was the most important, why? Why are you doing this? Why is it being done? And to go back to your question about the theater, I wasn't seeing the why so much. The why was, oh yes, we want audiences to come in. We want people to buy tickets. It's something that I remember being uh, at a panel with Anna Devere Smith, where she talked about the difference between consumers and citizens. And we talked about, yeah, that's very much in terms of like the difference between ticket buyers and audience and what it means, you know, to be mm -hmm. that audience that's listening, that's in the seeing place, that's seeing into them. You know, why do people go to the theater? Why do people do theater? What is the meaning of the theater? And that wasn't a new question for me. I was already having that question, but in a way the world sort of made that question even more intense. Mm -hmm. And so like, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Who are we doing it for? And how can we do it? Is, I think, the question for everyone. I mean, I think survival is, a good, is going to be a bigger and bigger issue, just survival. And I think then um, Josh Fox, who I work with, who did the um, documentary on, on, on fracking, the gas land cycle, uh, is, is, is has been working on a piece called The Truth Has Changed, which looks at, it looked at the whole thing about the truth, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook and a lot of it, you know, it, it just swirled out from, from there. But uh, what are, you know, the questions he asks in the piece is like, uh, we have to think about, you know, not getting the gun, but the, you know, the spare bedroom. Who do we put in the spare bedroom? How do we expand our community? You know, how do we open up our lives and our hearts to people that it's just going to get worse? We haven't even, we've seen the beginning of climate change refugees. I mean, Syria, the whole thing in Syria really was climate change because of the drought for two years and the farmers begging for some sort of redress. So how do we function with our communities, even if it's a small community? You know, how do we function inside that? What, what, you know, what are our ethics? And then how are our ethics revealed in the aesthetics? And that's the thing about theater. When I first came to New York in the mid seventies, uh, I really, well, first I was interested in musicals. That was the other thing that I got into at an early age, musicals. For a while I was a singer, then I had kind of um, physical issues that I couldn't really sing. I've started singing again a little bit, which is really exciting for me because I haven't really been singing for a long time. Um, so I loved musicals. And my father would, would go to business trips in New York and would bring back the, the cast album for musicals, including things like Subways Are for Sleeping, I don't know if anyone remembers that musical, but I used to sing that, that song where they go, get up, get a crossover, get that, you know, they had a whole subway song. I don't even remember the plot, but I remember that song, uh, Kiss Me, Kate, Camelot, I mean, all these, you know, I grew up with the musicals. And then I performed like a lot of people did. I performed musicals in high school and things like that and thought that that's what I would do. I thought I would be a musical theater performer, but that didn't pan out. But I wanted to have a life in the theater um, uh, I think partly because I felt the theater contained everything, all the arts, visual, lighting, costuming, you know, contained philosophy. Again, going back to the source of Shakespeare, you know, he stole all his plots or borrowed all his plots. Everybody borrowed plots at that time, right? It would be disaster now. He wouldn't have a career. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, and he, he was a terrific poet, but there were other really great poets around. 
And I always felt that Shakespeare's ability, whoever he was, and I do think he was the, you know, the, the son of a working uh, bourgeois, not, not really working. Love maker. Huh? Love maker, yeah. yeah. You know, that he, you know, that he wasn't, didn't come from the arist aristocracy. He didn't, wasn't one of the Cambridge wits and like a oh, whole, of course. And I always thought the proof that he really did exist was Robert Greene's invective, you know, that called him that upstart crow, you know, you know, with the things he makes, the shake scene, you know, and I always thought that the fact that the other writers were grumpy about him actually meant that he was who he said he was. Though I also think that he collaborated a lot more than people think. I think when it was really fascinating, this new edition of the Henrys, which say, which say that he and, and Marlowe collaborated on the Henry the Sixes, which makes perfect sense, you know, and his whole relationship, you know, his rivalry or whatever their relationship was. Uh, you know, he wrote five plays basically in response to Marlowe's plays, including Titus and Andronicus, which I disagree with Harold Bloom. I think it was satire and it works really well as a dark comedy, which is how Taylor Mack actually started his play, uh, you know, uh, that turned into just saying, you know, a sequel to Titus Andronicus, you know, mm -hmm. what happens at the end. And because he was going to do an adaptation and then he felt, I don't want to have Lavinia's mutilated body on the stage. I don't want to put those women's bodies on the stage and continue to do that, which moved me a lot. And he said, I think I'd rather do a sequel. And I said, oh, well, what's, well, how does it start? And he says, curtain risers, there's a pile of bodies on the stage and the maid arrives with a mop to clean up. I said, wow, are you the maid? Yes, originally he was going to play. And I said, what's, what's your name? And he said, Gary. Mm. which I thought was hysterical. Um, so, yeah. Um, but that whole idea of uh, I mean, yeah, how things react to other things and the philosophy, the philosophy at the core of Shakespeare for me and at the core of, of most writers that I really love uh, is why how do people navigate in the world they're in? How do people navigate in the lives they're in? How do people, and I say this to, to my students, and this you see in, in movements, like all the exciting movements that started with the black, well, started again in some ways with the black arts movement and in the 60s and all that, where people said, no, we are going to take the pen that writes our narrative, very Luddite. We're gonna take the pen that writes our, narr our narrative into our own hands. We're gonna control that narrative as much as possible, as much as you can control a narrative in life, right? Which is like anything could happen at any time. You know, a truck could speed around this curve, you know, and smash into me as I'm walking down to the theater, which they're always nervous about. Uh, so anything could happen at any time, right? And the whole idea of like having at least control of the pen in your hand that can write your narrative or the brush that's able to paint your own portrait, not someone else's reflection of you. And this is where I know like people have in call out ca ca uh, culture, Luigi Pirandello is in big trouble because at one point he was very pro Mussolini and the legend has he melted his Nobel prize, you know, down to help support the cause. But I think it was only a year and it was right before he died. But and you can kind of, if you look at, at uh, Pirandello's background, you kind of understand why like, you wanted everything very like clear, you know, like, oh, the trains are going to run on time and all this. But what his theories are, which despite of, you know, his rather uh, unfortunate political uh, mistake or embracing, mm -hmm. is that his theories of mirror and mass are really fascinating and very, you know, that especially you know, what are the masks you put on to survive in the world? And then how you look at your own face, you see your own face because you're mirrored back to yourself. And what and who is that mirror, right? So if you look at uh, whole groups of people, when they start out and their identity is like mirrored back to them, things are taken the way that, they, that, that they're able to root themselves into their real core powerful identity. And then they're mirrored back to themselves in a very productive way, in a very destructive way, and often in oppressive ways. And then they start to kind of say, oh, this is my, this is my face. 
So when I look at my own mirror, I'm looking at the face that has been mirrored back to me. And that's why so you have to shatter that mirror. Sometimes you have to have a mirror to look at yourself and sometimes you have to shatter the mirrors. And I think what this time is doing is that it's shattering mirrors. Yes. Did it for you, did it sh sh shatter your mirror? My mirror was already shattered. <laughs> My mirror was really already shattered. I don't know that it's had such a big impact on me, except sort of saying, there it is. Oh, I was waiting for this to come. I kind of sensed that 2020 was going to be a rough year. I didn't sense that there was going to be a pandemic. Mm -hmm. But it felt to me we were heading towards something where we could no longer, you know, the tipping point, you know, the, the, where, the, where it wouldn't hold, where things would start to collapse where it would be like, what do they call metal fatigue in the society? Um, I think the pandemic has, you know, has speeded that up. And in a way, the pandemic is a shattering of, of, of the mirror in terms of looking at ourselves and saying, well, who, who are we? You know, the whole Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, that's been around since the, you know, 1619. But, uh, you know, what that is and what that reveals about us as individuals and what it reveals to us as a society. And so it's, it's, it's a very hard time. I think it's going to get harder. Uh, for me, it's not even so much our theater is going to open. It's like, will our society survive? Um, but I can't believe that, uh, that Kentucky and Senator, I'm not even going to say his name, Mitch, quoted Martin Luther King's incredible quote about the, the arc, you know, of, of, of justice, you know, and then saying, but what he did say, which I always say, is that doesn't, what, which Dr. King said, is that doesn't happen on its own. We have to bend it. We have to bend it. How do we bend it? And we bend it with a core of our vision our ethics, our ideologies, um, our concern, our compassion, our, you know, what we form at the center, what our core intentionalities are, the communities we gather around us that are strengthened and also challenge us, but are strengthened by us so that there's a kind of dialogue that's going on and that those communities can get larger and larger and that, you know, what keeps them together is the core, is the, is the magnetic core of what the belief is. And if that is some sort of, you know, uh, Radical empathy, you were talking about radical movements, radical empathy, you know, the whole thing about like, uh, uh, was it radical geometry where you find that, you know, no matter how separate the circles are, if you track their radiuses at one point, they're all going to converge, some of them way outside of those circles, but what is the center mm -hmm. of that circle? And if you say that is the new center of the circle, then what is the circle that embraces everyone? It's like, I love Venn diagrams. I'm a sucker for Venn diagrams. As I say, where is the sweet spot between people that don't seem to have anything in common? They will have something in common. Um, years ago, the mayor of Austin, oh, his name's also flown out of my head, but I was so inspired by him, was talking about this whole idea that what he was doing in Austin was saying, here were people who were just on extreme ends, but then he found the radical center, though I don't think he used that word or the sweet spot, where they cared about their kids. And that's where he started from. You start from the sweet spot of what is shared, right? And I think that's what theater can do. The theater can find that sweet spot so that people come and they don't all react in the same ways, nor should they, but they resonate to it. And I love, I love what's happening uh, with science. I, I, I think physics, you know, how physics enters in and biology. So some of the things that they've discovered, um, like mirror neurons, when they kind of discovered mirror neurons, you know, by accident because the, they were doing experiments on monkeys, which is sort of horrible, but the scientists, you know, noticed that the brain wave, the monkey had been attached and he noticed that the brain wave of the monkey watching him eat a nut was the same, pretty similar as the brain waves of the monkey actually eating the nut himself. 
So it was like the mirror neurons and empathy. And that's, if there's like a, a metaphor for the theater, that seems to be it. Um, and this whole thing, that's actually a line uh, uh, that uh, Matthew Glassman says, one of the performers, writers here at Double Edge, says in his piece uh, in Six Feet Apart Altogether, uh, he says, our hearts are beating at the same time. And that's the whole thing that they did this study that in the theater, uh, your hearts, the audience's hearts start to beat, you know, in synchronicity, which is amazing. So for me, those things are to go back to the center, to go back to the source, to go back to what is really, what, what, what brings us together, what is shared, not identically, right? But what is, what is, you know, what resonates for us is what the theater can do. So the whole thing in terms of like, why do you do it? For whom do you do it? I mean, let's face it, the theater, Broadway, I can't go afford to go to Broadway shows. <laughs> my students can't afford to go to most theater. So who's the theater for and what is it for? I mean, I, my, my whole interest in theater really moved much more to ensembles. Like I became very much a support of the network of ensemble theaters and the National Performance Network, you know, and also the National New Play Network, you know, the smaller theaters who I, you know, might be the ones that end up surviving more because they do have, you know, they do know what it is to scrabble closer to the ground to survive. And also I find that the, the why of what they're doing and why they're doing it and their sense of community uh, tends to be stronger. It's like the, the, that Mike Daisy piece, they did How Theater pa Failed America, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of, and the Todd London books, the Ben Pesner and Todd London, you know, book in terms of, you know, really looking at the landscape and what is it about and what the marketplace the, is. The manifestos that he put together. The, uh, yeah, yeah. So, and I've been very lucky in my life. I, I really, I probably wouldn't have stayed at, at places that weren't like this, quite, quite frankly, I, you know, is that, but I was very lucky to, to be at the public with Joe Pack, you know. How did you, meet, huh? how did, how did you meet him, Joe Pack? I met him because I met Lynn Holst, who was the literary manager at the time. And she went off to work for American Playhouse for many years, wonderful, wonderful dramaturg. Uh, and she was the, the, the literary manager there. And we actually met because Colleen Dewhurst, who was with Ken, the producer, Ken Marcelet at the time, was doing a show in Cleveland. And the former person who Lynn used to work with, Mel Melanie Carville, who uh, was the great actor, Jack McGowan's stepdaughter, was working for Ken Marcellet. Um, so they were going off to, to Cleveland at Thanksgiving and their son, Alex, was off somewhere else. But their young son, Campbell, the great, wonderful actor, Campbell Scott, who was about 15 or 16 at the, at the time, was staying home at, at Flood Farm, it was called. Uh, and so Colleen and Ken said, well, you know, to, to say, uh, why don't you just ask some of your friends, Melanie said to Melanie, well, ask some of your friends to come up for Thanksgiving and spend the weekend and keep an eye on Campbell, who's the sweetest kid ever, uh, who was like, who had a little guest house next to the main house. So I'm, uh, that's where I met Lynn Holst. And uh, she was starting a wonderful series of the public called Poets of the Public, which was during that time, there's a jazz series, you know, series and a poetry series and a film series. And they had the Latino festival. There was all this stuff going on right, at, at the public along with the mobile unit. I was really happy when Oscar really brought back the whole you know, public works. Uh, yeah. in, in that way. I always thought it was one of the most important things the public did. Uh, but uh, yeah, so she said, uh, do you want to come intern in the literary office? So I said, yeah, I would love to. And that's how it started. And then I was filing play reports because at that point there were thousands of scripts, unsolicited scripts that came in every year. And um, yeah, so and all these readers would come, actors, directors, writers would come take the scripts away and then write little reports, half page reports, what it was about, what was good about it. Was it someone we should pay attention to? What kind of letters should we write back, right? 
Should we just be polite? Should we say, not this play, but please keep in touch? Should we, you know, maybe engage in them? So I would read all these reports as I was filing them, because I'm really a speed reader. So I go, blah, 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 and file it, and blah, 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 and file it. And then people would say, oh, what was that play? And what did the reader think about it? And I'd, I'd sort of chirp up, and, you know, because I remembered reading. And then uh, Joe Papp came by once when I was there at the filing cabinet. Uh, and he said something to me and I just kind of quipped back to him. I didn't realize you weren't supposed to, you know, like quip back to Joe, you know, this you know, little dog. Uh, and he got very surprised. He said, what are you talking to me? And I said, a cat can talk to a king from Alice. And that was like, he said, oh, you need a bath, little dog and I'll feed you. <laughs> so that's really the way it started. And Robert Blacker, uh, who I passed away very recently, uh, uh, who was the associate literary manager, dramaturg. He worked a lot with Des Mackinoff. He was a uh, Shakespeare dramaturg. Um, he really mentored me. And that, this was really before there were dramaturgical programs. In fact, he had me read a script in front of him because I wanted to be a script reader. I loved reading plays. I was so interested in it. I'd like fallen in love with Sam Shepard's work and Beckett and all these plays. I'd, I'd gone to see uh, the, it wasn't the open theater, it was the Winter Project with Joe Chaikin and his whole group. And I was just into you know all of this stuff. So he said, uh, he said, well, okay, read a play and we'll see what you think about it. I said, great, I'll, I'll bring it home. I'll bring the report tomorrow. And he said, no, 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 read it in front of me. So I read it in front of him, talking through. And then there was just this moment where he got to the second act and there was a scene, like the second scene or something in the second act. And I said, oh, oh, it falls apart here. And he says, yes, it does. He says, so what's wrong with that scene? I said, I actually don't think it's, anything is wrong with that scene. I think that something needed to happen in this scene in the first act in order to set up this scene. And if that happened in the first act, actually this scene would work really well. And I'll never forget, Robert looked at me and he went, wow, he said, I think you might be a dramaturg. And I'd never heard the word before. And I always joke with my students, I say, it sounded like you used a shovel and got really dirty. Uh, and uh, then he sort of said what it was. It was about research. It was about reading. Eventually, it was about having dialogues with writers about their work, you know, also helping to, you know, dialogue potentially with directors and, and also, you know, working in, in creating projects with, you know, that all the different things that a dramaturg could do and that all the different things that you needed to know that you needed to know about design, and not all dramaturgs think this way, but I do, is that you need to know about design, you need to know about staging, you need to know about the kinetics of the stage, you need to know that sometimes what's wrong is not the necessarily of the line, but the light cue and the, the level that the light is at and the, the, you know, that it's fading on a seven count and not a five count, and that makes the difference. Right, that, that dramaturgy. And so I really feel that dramaturgy is something everybody participates in inside a theater project. That you all have to be participate in the dramaturgy. And I think the metaphor for that in our society is that we all have to participate in the dramaturgy of our society. Hmm. Yeah. How do we dramaturg our own lives, our cities, our yeah. communities? Yeah. Yep. Our relationships, you know. Yep. It's yep. a much bigger, it's a, as you say, mirror something. And uh, I remember I was holding a dramaturgy um, sessions at the Siegel Center, and that was one director, I think, from the Mint. Others say, well, if the director is so stupid that he or she doesn't know what to do with the play and needs someone else, like a dramaturg, I wouldn't hire the director, you know, and uh, it, which is shocking, you know. And, and, yeah. uh, and uh, it's thinking that European directors like Peter Stein, if they don't have two or three of the most significant dramaturgs, they wouldn't start working, you know? Right, uh, right. Because their brain is fully given over to the theatricality. And let's face it, European directors tend to be more theatrical. Mm, the yeah, great yeah. theatrical directors in this country, you know, whether you're talking about Robert Woodruff or Joanne Acolytis, you know, Anne Bogart kind of found a way to navigate it, but the really theat Peter Sellers, who right, is just been doing, you know, all of these great theatrical directors that really use spectacle, spectacle aligned with thought, right? Because I love that. Not just spectacle, it's spectacle as a, as a, you know, as a delivery system for thought as well and for emotion. But you look at the great theatrical directors in this country, 
They don't do well. That's true. Yeah. Well, Ruth yeah. works with dramaturge. One or even two is a significant to Yeah, yeah. 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 Because, you're gonna, because you know, you're going to because you have that dialogue. Dialogue. You're thinking. I'm thinking the image. I'm thinking the image. I'm thinking the image. What does that image mean? You figure it out. The way Richard Foreman is with actors. Like Richard Foreman works with really good actors because they take care of themselves. You know, if some an actor says, uh, you know, Richard says, cross across. This is the beat. Turn your head. You know, do this movement. This is your your choreography. This is how you fit into the mechanism. You know, the actor says, what is my motivation? Richard will say, that's not my job. That's your job. You figure it out. So, you know, so you look at someone like David Patrick Kelly, who's a great, great actor, you know, and he does these Richard Foreman works and he knows what he's doing all the time. He has, you know, he's activated. He has, you know, he has an incentive. He has, you know, he knows what his motivation is. Mm. Yeah, and uh, someone like Pina Bausch, who created mm. a dance much or like Reinhardt. Mm well, now does his own work, but who she was the first thing, even in, you know, in her work, this is wordless of Tanztheater, you know, she said how significant uh, um, that is. And now we have, of course, objects on stage, the light, uh, uh, robots, uh, plants and animals and, and, and all of it, Castellucci's work, you know, um, yeah. highly dramaturgical and um, Pierre Santa Di Matteo who works with it, and so many others. So you have been, uh, on, on the forefront of that, do you feel, you, you said not really, but it already was smashed that, mi that mirror of the surface, but do you feel in this time of Corona, you realize something or you say, I'm gonna devote more time to this or that this became clearer to me? Do you feel there has something has happened? Um, I actually don't, oddly enough, because I feel it was already here. I feel a virus, a physical virus is just a manifestation, you know, and that's very Arto, I guess, you know, that's what he talked about. Mm. You know, that the physical manifestation of a disease, of a virus, of a pandemic is a manifestation of something else that's going on, you know, not Susan Sontag, you know, not the psychological individual has made themselves sick, that kind of thing. But as a society, we do make ourselves, you know, sick. And you look at it, what's the thing? You know, it's our, our dealings with animals, you know, that it could probably, you know, started, you know, in a wet market. Uh, you know, how we deal with animals, all the diseases that come from animals. I and mean, we haven't seen the beginning of it yet. Corona, I think that's nothing to what's coming. We really have to be prepared. We have to be prepared to support each other. We have to be prepared to, and I, I actually don't like the word love because people I think overuse it a lot, but I do like the word love because I do, you know, the whole thing about, again, Shakespeare. Okay, Shakespeare, here's going back to Shakespeare. He puts, I think one of the best definitions of love into the mouth of essentially a 13 year old girl where Juliet says, you know, my bounty is as boundless as the sea, my love as deep. The more I give, the more I have, for both are infinite. And I remember uh, reading uh, Sylvie and Bruno, uh, which is um, um, a Lewis Carroll book that's about these two kids that are, that are looking for their father and they go through fairyland. But there's a really moment at the beginning uh, uh, Sylvie's father gives her a locket and it, on one side it's blue and on the other side it's red and on the blue side it says Sylvie will be loved and on the, on the red side it says Sylvie will love and she has to make a choice well there's two lockets actually there's two lockets sorry I'm, I'm, I just messed it up there's two lockets and she has to make a choice between them and I remember reading it as a kid going well I really like the color blue but I love that idea of the red that she will love. Somehow that felt more important to me, right? That being loved is like, right, mm, but loving is like Juliet, ooh, loving, right? So she chooses the red one. And then when she finds her father and whatever, she says, look at your locket. And she looks at the locket and it's blue. She said, wait, I have the wrong one. And she turns it over and she has both lockets. And I always was so impressed as a little girl by that philosophy and that core, again, that core idea that center of gravity. And I think we have to find uh, that in ourselves and what that means. 
that to care and love is attention like right? love is your willingness to give attention unequivocal attention to something whether it's your work whether it's a person you know your favorite anything your attention that it, it is a, it is a gravitational pull for your attention and the more that that's shared i think the stronger society comes and people in power and oppressive regimes and people who are miserable and people who have like i tell my students and the Sanskrit notion of unstable pride. I think practically everything that's wrong with you people can be driven to unstable pride, whether it's greed or vanity or braggadociousness. If your pride and you, you know, is stable just with nothing, just who you are. I once said to Joe when he said, don't you know who I am? I said, well, Mr. Papp, I think you are who you are when you're naked in the desert alone in front of your God. I can't believe it. I said to him, I was about 23, and he basically looked at me and said, get out of my office. And I went out of the office and everyone's there thinking of the God Morgan's being yelled at. And I went, I'm not fired. And they kept saying to me, I said, well, what if he fires? What if he's had enough of you one day and fires you? And I said, well, if, if he fires me for that, why would I want to work for him? Mm -hmm. That's right? true. Right. So, and I think because I never had any sense of security at all, ever since I was a very, very little girl, I never expected it. And I think the expectations we have is what does us in. But uh, it's exciting seeing the how and what people are doing. Can, can I talk about that a little bit? Where yeah. are we at? Yeah, we get we, we want to get closer. Maybe maybe just one or two thoughts. About it. So what what would a Joe Pap do? Do you have a feeling what what he would be in this crisis? What would you what would be your guess? Oh, he'd probably be organizing a testing site, and having drives to give people you know the requirements they need you know, and having uh, you know sending theater into neighborhoods on the mobile unit. He'd probably revive the mobile unit and find some way to socially distance, you know, going back to uh, the, you know, the, uh, the actual mobile units on the truck, even maybe going back to the, you know, to the pageant wagons, where you see a scene, you gather, you know, in, in a place and, you know, keep distance from each other and have your mask. And then the first scene of the first act would come by and then maybe the actors would, you know, then the second scene or whatever, of, of some sort of thing, he'd find a way. Probably go back into the East Side Amphitheater. He'd yeah. find a way to make the park work, probably. Yeah. 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 He'd, make, yeah. he'd find a way to make the park work. Something we, we... But he'd, you know, he'd have t a testing, he'd make the public theater a testing site. Mm. That I have no doubt. And he'd be what, you know, what the public theater is doing or was doing. Uh, they were a haven for the demonstrators. It was wonderful, you know? There are aspects of Oscar that, that resonate with what Joe and, and that aspect of deciding, and there are aspects that don't, definitely don't, but there are aspects that do. Uh, and that deciding, you know, the decision of the public and their fabulous staff uh, to have the lobby open and to give water and to have the bathrooms open, you know, and to have like, if you needed to come and, you know, be in the lobby and, you know, you could come do that. And several theaters did that. Um, uh, New York Theater Workshop did that. The Flea did that. Several mm -hmm. other theaters. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's what he would do. And he would be gung-ho about all these things that are happening, like up here at Double Edge. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, six feet apart all together. Not a little bit. It's not six feet under, luckily. It's six feet. No, it's not six feet under. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit. I mean, you also, you know, as, I, as far as I know, you, you, uh, you know so many things and in contact also across the country, you know, tell us a bit what's going on. What do you think? This is of interest. This is something we could, we should know about. Well, there are, there are, Pittsfield, Massachusetts seems to be the hub 
right now. And Massachusetts um, has very, it was a really interesting process in terms of, yes, you can do theater, but these are the parameters. This is what you have to do. This is how you have to handle the bathrooms, which is probably the trickiest situation. You have to have exit and, and you know flow for the audience as well as being six feet apart and masked. So uh, the Berkshire Theater Company is, uh, is, is, is doing uh, live theater uh, a Barrington stage is doing live theater, and they're both in in uh, in Pittsfield or around Pittsfield. Uh, let me just because uh, yeah, the Berkshire Theater Group. Uh, Kate McGuire is the artistic director there. Um, so there they have an indoor theater, but they're not using that. They have a they're putting a a, 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 a tent, a Colonial Theater. They have a tent there, and uh, starting in August, they're going to do the one of the first equity approved. Things, which is Godspell. They're going to do a production of Godspell. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they figured out a way to do that. Um, Barrington Stage, uh, also Julie Boyd there. They're doing like uh, David Kale's wonderful piece, a solo piece that another actor, Mark Dold, is doing, um, uh, Henry Clark. Henry Clark, Henry Clark. Uh, so they're doing that. And um, they have a whole series cycle of. Uh, performances also so does uh, Berkshire Theater Group uh, so and they figured out like one I forget which one uh, like their seating capacity is usually 500 but now it's going to be 185 uh, bread and puppet Peter Schumann you know that do their huge things that they have they're trying to figure out a way to continue that they're doing it maybe 150 or so people can be there it's in terms awesome. of, yeah you know and, and it if you're outside, you know, it's much easier if you're in a tent. Uh, but, but Ubuntu in Oakland, uh, so, the, so the Oakland, uh, uh, the Oakland Theater Project uh, is doing Wasteland with this is solo show, Lisa Ramirez, who's a wonderful playwright and actress and dramaturg too, is performing that. And that's gonna be drive-in theater. So there's like drive-in movies that are happening, but they're basically gonna be in the parking lot of the theater. And you have like a radio feed, but you can watch and hear that way. So the drive-in theater, that's happening. Um, the theater in El Paso, I think it's called Theater Across Borders. Um, and that, that takes people on like on a hike, 10 people at a time where there's kind of theatricality. So in some ways that the aspects of what Double Edge is doing, because when Double Edge, it's a, three groups that go Three. It's like Irene Fornes, right? It's like Fefu. You go to see, you know, different pieces in different orders, but you see all of them and your base. It's like 30, 35 people or so come and they're split into groups of like maybe 10 to 12, which keeps that social distancing. And the actors are distanced from each other as well. Mm. Uh, mostly. I mean, we've now been pretty much quarantined together. I'm also performing in it. Yeah. Again, singing, which is very exciting for me, not to having been able to Also, this for Taylor Max, right? You know, you yeah, 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 I was, that's right. I was, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was in Taylor Max 24 hour. I was a dandy minion mm -hmm. in his 24 hour concert. And I'm working still. Taylor Max seems to always work on five projects at a time. Uh, he's working on a musical uh, kind of look at Socrates' last hour after he's taken the hemlock, which is called The Hang, which is us hanging with him, you know, in his last hour. Uh, and he's working with Matt Ray, his fabulous composer and music director, and we're kind of collaborating. So it's going to be sort of a music jazz piece. But again, what makes it, what I love about Taylor is that Taylor really starts from the why, what is it, what for, you know, who is it for, why are we doing this, what's the exploration. So his whole thing is like, well, why do you want to do this? He says, the whole question of how can you be moral in an immoral world? Right. So that's the center of gravity. And again, the mirror of how we look at the questions that we're having. And Depending on COVID, this was something that um, actually um, uh, here, Kristen Marting at here had, had um, commissioned Gary originally before it kind of became this big commercial production. Uh, so this is the piece that he's going to do at here in, in, to replace that commission. I'm very excited about it. So how it's going to be done? How is the question, right? Want to yeah. do it. So how is it going to be done? 
how do you have a, uh, hey, you don't, you don't want to get close to Socrates. You don't want to get close to each other. You know, you're in disguise. Maybe your masks are massive. You're disguising yourself from being recognized at being at Socrates's, hey. You know, there's all kinds of like, how, how do you, you know, you know how do you solve, you know, the issue? How do you make the, it's, uh, you know, it's the Ching. It's like oh, obstacles, great obstacles are great opportunity. Oh, like in your as idea. long as you're oh, yeah. healthy and not on the street and not a refugee and, you know, as long as you're like one of the lucky ones. And I think Carl touched on this a little bit when he was saying that he actually it was sort of really making him think deeply and whatever. Um, but I do think for those who have, yeah, mm -hmm. Carl Hancock rocks, uh, who... Uh, <laughs> who I introduced, Melanie Joseph had introduced him to me when I was at the public and had started what was then going to turn into Joe's Pub. It was kind of a little festival. We made a Joe's Pub on the, on the stage of the Newman Theater. And she said, you have to meet this guy, Carl Hancock Rooks. So that was the first time I met him. And I'll never forget, I went, Carl Hancock Rooks! It was such a great name to introduce. Um, it was just extraordinary. But yeah, you know, deeply moving and thoughtful what he said. Oh, brilliant and yeah, so so yeah, deeply moving, deeply moving, deeply feeling and wonderful, wonderful writer. But you know, what he said, you know, also is that those of us who have the luxury to do this, to not worry about we're gonna be evicted in two minutes and we do have food to eat and we're not worrying about our children and you know, we're not sick. Uh we, you know, it's a luxury and it's also an obligation. We have an obligation to ask these questions of ourselves, you know. Yeah. I think we have an obligation. Yeah, and we have to change. And it. to be said, inventive. Yeah, huh? You said, what would all, all those people have died for if we don't? Exactly. From it, you know, it's. Uh, it's exactly. We few, we happy few, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe not so happy, mm. but. Well, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, good to good, good to hear from you. It reminds me of that old. I think it's the Polish definition of optimism and pessimism. The uh, pessimist says things cannot possibly get any worse, and the optimist says yes, they can. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love that. Yeah, I this love is that. Perhaps the time uh, to be a resilient optimist. Say, yes, actually, this can get yeah. worse, and we haven't seen it, and we have to react. So, listen. I mean, we could um, talk for much more time, and uh, also get an update uh, from you. Maybe even whatever three months, half a year. We'll see how things are coming up. Anything you still want to share on the on the screen or? Um, um, or something um, to say? Um, no, I would. You know. This this piece of Double Edge is phenomenal. I think it's inspirational. Unfortunately, it's sold beyond sold out. Um, but I think, you know, to go to the website, see some of the articles, and also just check out, you know, some of the, the things that people are starting to do around the country mm -hmm. in terms of being inspired, you know. Also, Great Small Works, which is a puppet company that um, my politi the puppet, the political puppet company I'm involved with, with it started during Occupy is kind of, uh, you know, been umbrellaed by, does these uh, puppet slams, uh, like yeah. every, there's yeah. one coming yeah. up, a spaghetti dinner in August that's coming up. And that's both live, live puppet shows of people doing live puppet shows and also recorded puppet shows. So that's a whole, we never know what's going to happen at any given time. But that's kind of, you know, again, the community. And so it's an outlet for everyone, but it's also the building of community. The labyrinth, the, the theater company labyrinth that did a reading, you know, several weeks ago. Uh, it was just a Zoom reading, but it was so moving, you know, just to have them read with each other and have that community. So I think even the Zoom readings, um, A Brave New World uh, did, you know, like a different act of Hamlet with different directors and company members from all over the world, you know, one act a week. Uh, which was really fun. You know, La Mama's doing things uh, from, from, from their series, you know, yeah, Public, yeah. Joe's yeah. Pub. You know, a lot of things are happening. Lots of things are happening. So it's good, yeah. it's good to hear from you. It's good to get the update. And it's, you know, important to keep in mind 
really um, um, what you said and for everybody who's working in the arts, but also in our lives, you know, that this is a, a physical manifestation of something that has been wrong, that has infected us and, uh, and maybe as a way to see how do we get, get, get through this and that distancing perhaps is something that will have to bring us closer uh, together yeah. and something that was missing missing before. And um, yeah, so tomorrow we have with us uh, Heli Minardi from Indonesia, who's going to talk about her work mm. in Indonesia. And also she's putting together groups like you of art uh, artists and uh, how to support, how to stay connected in the world. We're going to hear from Lebanon, from Dima Mata. It's going to be, it's a tough, tough, tough time in Beirut. It's collapsing. Mm. After the hard time in civil war, this kind of opening. And right now it seems to be a uh, one of the places, as you say, you know, where we, we, we have not seen what is really happening um, in that world. And on Friday, Richard Schachner will be with us and, and give us a, his a view of the world and uh, talk a bit about also his journal, which he is putting together a COVID thing where he has really this, uh, oh, good. Uh, writers from around the world, uh, how they, what they do think about. So really, Morgan, it was great to have you with us. It is important Thank you. What you do. It's so important what you have done. And it's also important what you are going to do. And yeah, and it's it's shocking to hear that someone like you who teach at Columbia University says, I can't afford to go to see a Broadway show I want to see. Um, it's uh, just shocking. It shows what is really wrong. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, Adjunct well, professors? Mm, yeah. Although think, Columbia is better than most. That is true, yeah. But still, in, in general, I mean, we have music colleagues who say it's tough to get to find uh, you know, the, 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 the way to go to the concerts they would like to see. So something is really wrong, the access to the arts, the access to health, the access to education, and things have yeah. to change. And I hope we are a little bit part of that change, as you said, to create a community. And just by observing, I think, and Bogart said that, quoting a physicist, you observe something, you notice. Yeah. Maybe something also changes, And uh, but it is a call to action. And as you said before, it is us. Uh, we have to be part of the change and be the change if we... Yeah. If we want to see it. And um, the so touch bases that you do with all these people, and what I love so much, especially Frank, is that it is international, as international as it is, because we tend to get really, really provincial in this country, you know, and to hear yeah. from all these other artists, from these other countries, from what's going on and the other perspectives, and to really broaden our, our, our view of the world and ourselves is really, really important. And to have the consistency of that's been wonderful. And hopefully symbolically it stands for something bigger that there is a listening to the world also here in america in new york and uh, that yeah. we, we we have to take into account so really thank you thanks for how round uh, yes today. that records so them so i can see all the ones i missed <laughs> and uh, as thanks uh, to our listeners it's uh, as you say it's a lot out there it means a lot to us that you take the time that you listen to the artists what they have to say is significant first also they need to know that people are interested and we have to support them but also what they have to say might change something yeah. contribute yeah. an authentic yeah. change yeah. what more said, what Carl said, what Oncia said, what Shrekner, so many said, it can yeah. help us to maybe redefine the dramaturgy of our own lives. And as thanks to the Siegel team, Andy and Sun Yang, and uh, oh. uh, I hope you will be able to... Um, can I just sneak one more in for those of you around Chatham, New York? There's a yeah. fabulous performance space called PS21, which is performance space for the 21st century that's starting to do in their band shell, socially distant, mainly concerts, but that also have all kinds of plans for kind of little like walking tours and more theatrical events coming into the fall. So they're also very being very creative wow. about approaching this. You heard it first here. I was not aware. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah I heard it first here. And, uh, all the best for the double edge work for the opening. Of Thank you and see it and uh, and as Peter Schumann and says tribes and they're perhaps working in in, in, in nature uh, having their own space seems what's working what has always worked uh, Jean Barba talked about it too yeah. maybe this is a way to really think that is a way to do theater and and to do the theater you want in a community you create and be part of right. the community you're in so thank you so much and Morgan thank, thank you. you Frank thanks for asking